I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Natasha Vita Moore, a pioneering leader and community organizer in transhumanism and a proponent of human rights, morphological freedom, and ethical means for human enhancement. Called an early adopter of revolutionary changes by Wired Magazine and a role model for super longevity by The Village Voice, Dr. Vita Moore is the founder of the H Plus DAO, the first transhumanist decentralized autonomous organization, the executive director of Humanity Plus, has served as the president of the Extropy Institute, is on the scientific board of Lifespan.io, is a distinguished senior fellow at the Future of Mind Institute at FAU, and as a scientist, she has achieved a scientific breakthrough in vitrification and long-term memory. Dr. Vita Moore holds a PhD from the University of Plymouth, where she works as a professor of innovation, business, and ethics. She also holds a Master's of Philosophy and a Master of Science degrees, is a retired senior professor at UAT, and has lectured at Harvard, Stanford, Virginia Commonwealth, Cambridge, Alto, and Polytechnic universities, and was a visiting scholar at 21st Century Medicine. She joins us today to discuss life extension, transhumanism, and what it really means to be human in the 21st century and beyond. So Natasha, welcome back. Your credentials get longer every time you come on. So it's always a pleasure to be here. You are um, someone I admire enormously, not only for your astute thinking about the future and looking at the consequences and the issues we all need to be facing, but also your, your sense of design and, and professionalism, you know, posh. Oh, well, thank Sheep. you. Thank, <laughs> trust me, the, the pleasure is all mine. You, I mean, you are really the pillar of the transhumanist movement. You wrote, and we'll get into this later, but I mean, um, you have written all of these foundational documents outlining what it means to be transhumanist, the goals and ideals of the movement, and you have helped usher that in. And I think what we're seeing in society now is that is becoming a reality. And this all comes right back to you. So trust me, it is truly an honor. Uh, now, if it's okay, I want to start out by asking about your latest endeavor, Women in Longevity Leadership. This is a new project that you're working on. Can you tell us what it's all about? Uh, yes, it's my pleasure. Women in Longevity Leadership, the acronym is WILL. Got to have that will, that passion, that that in, to encourage others as well to be great advocates for healthy longevity. Women in Longevity Leadership stemmed out of a project I started two years ago called Women in Super Longevity, and I brought in a number of women to discuss our future, what is needed, what research is going on, and largely about how women have been very involved in longevity. Uh, very early on with um, infertility and taking a look at the uh, the amount of, of biotechnological advancements that stem out of the field of reproduction and infertility. So I thought it'd be very good to bring women in to discuss these things. Uh, so that was that group and um, it was the forerunner of women in longevity leadership. But what I decided was that I Actually, I was looking for an opportunity rather than it being a decision where some of the women in this group might think of where we could go next, how we could build on this, the very beginning ideas to build out something that could be a fundamental core project within the longevity industry. So out of that came women in longevity leadership. Uh -huh. Well, let me drill down a little bit on this. Um, on the website, Women in Longevity Leadership is described as, quote unquote, making an impact in longevity industry in its communities by building, innovating, educating, advocating, and fostering change. And again, you have been a crusader for all of these things for decades. So it, it, it sounds like in terms of this organization, it, it came out of fertility and some of those very women-centric issues. Uh, what are some of the other things that makes this organization truly unique? Unique and stands it apart from some of the other ones that are out yeah, there. Yeah, I, I think um, some of the things that make it really unique are my co-founders for Will, uh, Maria uh, Abramson from Sens and Lisa Fabinet from Sens, uh, 
Lisa is the CEO of SENS, as most of your audience know, and Maria is the um, the head of production. She's the director of projects, and she she uses her creative imagination to really advance a lot of the projects that SENS is working on. Um, not just in outreach, but looking at really high level, interesting projects. The I'll give you a bit of the history. Is that what you'd like? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so we were in New York City, and we were um, at a conference. We were at the Lifespan I.O. conference, and uh, there was no women. There's only one woman speaker, and I was on a panel. I wasn't invited to speak, which is fine. I don't need to speak at every conference. I was on a panel and I enjoyed that enormously. It was an amazing panel of the history of the longevity movement and industry. Maria and Lisa and I went to lunch and we were talking and they were asked by a Wall Street Journal journalist, Wall Street Journal journalist, uh, about women. Where are all the, the women? Why are uh, women speaking? And they said, well, we need to start a group. And Maria said, well, Natasha already started one. Maybe we can come together and collaborate and take it to the next level, which is precisely what I was looking for. And uh, we met and we decided and we came up with the, the concept of women in longevity leadership, the acronym again, WILL, it fit nicely. And um, we've been growing since then. The, um, the impetus behind it was precisely that we were at a conference where there were so many amazing women in the audience. Women who not only are scientists and entrepreneurs, women who run some of the leading clinics in the world on healthy longevity, women who are medical doctors, PhDs, who in the advocacy of longevity, women who have really contributed in enormous ways to longevity, but are not seen. And meaning not seen is not recognized necessarily at many of the longevity conferences. Now, I'm not saying all the conferences, but I'm saying many of the conferences. And then some of the same women are mentioned who, you know, they are great. There's, you know, all of it is wonderful. But what we saw as missing at that particular time in its history was an absence of many of the women who were coming to the conferences, but not invited to share their information in workshops and debates, uh, roundtables, etc. So that was the real impetus behind this. Oh, that is actually a complete surprise to me. Uh, you know, I'm connected, you know, on Facebook and in other social networks mm -hmm. with many people in the transhumanist movement. And there are so many women involved and they are driving this forward in terms of uh, biology, microbiology, genetic yes. engineering. I mean, on every level, right, from biotech up to, you know, like genetic research, uh, you know, genetic data modeling, all of those things. So it, mm -hmm. it's truly surprised to hear that they're underrepresented at conferences. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not just at conferences, it's in um, writings. Of, and this is something I've been trying to deal with for a number of years. The lack of citations of women's work in transhumanism, uh, predominantly, and in longevity, since it's so linked to longevity. The, um, you know, it, it seems like there has been what I would call as a professor, uh, cutting and pasting. I would tell my students, be careful not to cut and paste what you just read in their index or in their bibliography or who they mention in their referencing, in their citations. Find out new information, be looking for new sources, um, but I, I find that's missing. It's easier to cut and paste references and refer to the same ones. So that's what's happened. And it's a simple thing. It happens frequently in, in many different industries and, and fields, uh, but it's not always good because yeah. maybe the, the, the source that you're using, the reference source you're using to get your information for your thesis or your, your journalistic article uh, was a cut and paste job. So you're <laughs> repeating the cut and paste and it's the same players that get mentioned more frequently than others. So you're seeing more, let's just say not enough women whose work is seminal being mentioned because perhaps it's easier to use the names that are, are most obvious or have been used the most. But if you keep on using the ones over and over, then they will oh, appear to be okay. the most used and they may not be necessarily the most 
um, recent or authentic or in not importance as in hierarchy of importance, but um, referential, let's just say. Yeah, no, that makes that makes so much sense. Well, let me touch on your co-founders. You've mentioned them. So Lisa Fabinet and Maria Abramson, they are both accomplished leaders in longevity research. They're also both part of the SENS Research Foundation. So I thought I would ask about that because they are one of the key sponsors for this. Uh, a lot of people have heard about SENS. I, I'm one of them. I keep hearing the name, but I'm not that familiar with it. So I wanted to ask briefly if you could give us kind of an overview of what SENS is all about and how how they ended up becoming a co-sponsor for this yes it's it's interesting it's it's so simple first i'll, I'll explain what srf is it sends research foundation supports research projects that are focused on a damage repair paradigm and they work with universities and institutions around the world with the goal of dealing with age-related diseases such as the, the the basic ones, heart disease, cancer, different types of dementia like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, et cetera, that bring on um, loss of memory and, and decline in cognitive properties. Basically, the mission is to develop rejuvenation biotechnologies, which is based on the notion that it may be possible to apply the principles of regenerative medicine to the cellular and molecular damage of aging. And remember thinking about the molecular level of the, the information, the messaging systems that go on in proteinomics and genomics and all the omnics within the body. And it's very, very complex. So it's not an easy project, but the more we're developing um, the protocols and the further technology advances in the machinery, in the, in the, the ways we gather information in the field of, of biotechnologies and genomics, the better we're able to understand this, and this is so important, plus the added advantage of artificial intelligence in sorting out data has really pushed many fields in biotechnologies forward because one of the complications has been there's so much information, there's so much data, how to put it all together so that it makes sense, so that diseases can be identified first, you wanna catch it early, and then to find out what's causing it and then figuring out what's missing or what's what's too much or not enough of and trying to find that balance for it's like a homeostasis in in health ah okay well so that was sense and then the other sponsor is humanity plus and i have been following humanity plus for ages that is your organization it has been a tremendous advocate for transhumanism and life yeah. extension i mean it is just a prime mover in this area and again yes, you were the is. executive director for it so let me quickly ask you for an update on what's going on with h plus and i'm going to put a link in there just to make sure oh, that good. people visit and learn more about it because again it is crucially important in this area yes it is uh, Humanity Plus or H Plus is the largest transhumanist organization in the world. It's an international organization. It's based or incorporated in the United States. It's based everywhere, but it's incorporated in the United States. So its general office and its functionality as far as uh, being a 501c3 nonprofit is taxation of, of the U.S. dollar. But we accept cryptocurrencies and other um, uh, exchange as, as well. The, um, it's been around for a while. It's, it first started by two philosophers, Nick Bostrom and David Pierce, very lovely people. And um, they had an idea after meeting with Max Moore, myself in Marina Del Rey in the 1990s uh, to learn about transhumanism. Then they thought, well, we're in England, you're in California, and we go, well, we're, we're international. But um, they wanted to create something else so that we'd have more organizations besides just XRP Institute, which is the, the leading transhumanist organizer and really uh, established the movement through its projects. So the World Transhuman Association was founded, but it didn't last that long because there was too many political um, issues going on. And, and we know that politics can be daunting, but it's, it's needed. It's, it's very necessary. Um, but in any case, they decided to rebrand as Humanity Plus. And I think that was a darn good idea because Humanity Plus means uh, looking at the positive side of humanity. What can we do? How can we use our 
our natural innate abilities of problem solving and innovation and uh, looking for solutions, um, spreading kindness and generosity and sharing information. These are things we like to do. Uh, how can we use this to our best advantage when we're looking at a world that is changing and humanity is changing based on the current advances largely in the sciences and technologies. So Humanity Plus, that's its core, and its mission is to continually update its information and help people learn about some of the issues we're facing. And those issues include artificial intelligence. We have our our chairman of the board is a world leading expert of cognitive science in artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence. We work with many organizations on that. Another area is, of course, life extension and longevity. We have an, an a, a incredibly adept and erudite team of experts in that area who've been working in longevity for many years, not only as scientists, but also as philosophers and entrepreneurs. Uh, another area is space exploration, which we know is, is, is a favorite of many of us to look at the stars and to understand the beginnings of our universe and astrophysics and uh, the longevity of our own solar system is very important to us. So uh, that's an area that we focus on. Also, we focus on the environment. The uh, I, I call it climate disruption rather than climate change. And I want to make this a uh, distinct um, and clarify this because climate change has been happening since the Earth first came into being in our solar system through the influence of Jupiter and, and the sun and, and the rotation and everything that was going on at that time. Excuse me, my earplug. Um, so... I think that um, it's really important to consider that climate change has been happening since the Earth started. What we're experiencing now is a rapid um, time exchange. So less, rather than it being a lengthy time exchange between continental drift or um, a certain global warming or uh, the ice age, it's a shortened time span, so it's quickened. So it's a time quickening. Number one. Number two, there are more uh, people on the planet, more life on the planet. So that has kind of disrupted the biosphere in a way um, that the carbon exchange and carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen, etc. Is, is not at a balanced state as it once was or once was not. I mean, remember, climate change has been going on again for yeah many, many, many eons of years, as long as the planet's been in existence. So, but right now it's that time, it's speeding up, and that's something that we're very concerned about, but we don't want to get hyperbolic about it, and we want to look at all sides of the issues, because there are some contentions that, that the, the Earth is cooling off, and there's some contentions that it's not cooling off, and we need to get our facts straight. And this is very important in the sciences. So, but it's something that Humanity Plus has been looking at. And uh, recently we've had roundtables on some of these issues. Another area is economics, taking a look at a new capitalism. And um, the transhumanist approach is largely based on open source, open society, and um, open markets. And in capitalism, that's looked at often as free markets, but capitalism, which is uh, has been associated with transhumanism or humanity plus in negative ways, is not correct. In fact, there's different types of capitalism. So what type of, when they're saying, oh, you're just capitalist and you're just elite, um, you just want to take over the world as transhumanism. No, wait a minute. What do you mean by capitalism? Which capitalism are you referring to? Because we're talking about free market exchange where there's a healthy commons as healthy as possible, which is a daunting task in and of itself. And the external externalities um, are not so explosive or damaging on the markets where they overtake it and too much taxation or, or too much surcharges here and there. And inequities um, that can um, certainly shift the, uh, the, the, the common markets. So those are things that we think about, uh, but largely right now it's about artificial intelligence and longevity and looking at some of the complaints about transhumanism in general. And so the projects that Humanity Plus has done most recently is promoting our roundtables in dealing with bringing on people who question longevity or question artificial intelligence or um, are really fighting against corporations and longevity because they're very concerned about 
climate change and dealing with them, asking them what their beliefs are, what their views are, where they get their information and how we can better discuss it rather than making blatant large paintbrush stroke claims. Ah, well, and th so you have just touched on so many topics, but let me let me stick with longevity for just a moment. In terms of maximum human lifespan, the latest estimate that I've seen is 120 years. That's the absolute max. The average life expectancy in the U.S. I just looked this up last night. It stands at 77 years old, and the the baby boomer generation, which I believe is our largest generational cohort in the United States currently are between 59 and 77 years old. Mm -hmm. So I guess one thing I wanted to ask was, and again, because you are on the forefront of this research, you see, you see beyond the latest, you see what's coming as well as, you know, what is already here. Um, do you see advances pushing that 120 year max up further? And do you see any near term advances coming that may lead to a, a meaningful increase in near term life expectancy to help the boomer generation live longer, healthier lives? Yes, I do. Uh, first off, the maximum lifespan, just to uh, make an error correction here, um, the longest anyone lives is it's 122.3 years. And you may say, well, what's the difference between 120, 122? Well, there's a lot of difference, meaning what, why do most people not live that long? Why is usually the cutoff about 100? Usually you make it maybe to 100 and then it's downhill. But 122.3 years, uh, Jean Colmet, um, a French, uh, lovely, lovely woman uh, lived that long, and she is reported as the longest living person. And for your your listenership, uh, you, they might enjoy the Wired 2000. I'm looking at on my wall. The Wired 2000 featured magazine has an article on her and me, and it's quite wonderful to learn about her because she is an icon. You know, hats off to her um, to have lived that long. Okay, so. Yeah, why, why do we start really declining in our 90s and why can't we make it past 100 or 120? Why do we, do we hold up someone who lives to 122.3 years as an icon? What is it in their genes or in their lifestyle? Is it epigenetics? Is it genomics? Is it proteinomics? Is it something that we can't even identify yet that allows that person to live that long without dementia, mind you, and to be able to still walk and talk? you come at the same time what what is it and there are certain issues that we need to discuss and the first one you brought up besides the age the limitation the shelf life that humans have is the uh, baby boomers every day another baby boomer turns 65 and will for the next decade or two maybe and this is really a daunting and puzzling thing to think about Every day, another one turns 65 and another one turns 65. And what is this going to do to our economy? And what is it going to do to healthcare system? And what does this mean for the baby boomers? Are they living more longer and healthy? Are, do, are they turning 65 in good health? Or are they turning 65 with diabetes and early onset Alzheimer's or, you know, heart disease and the cancers? And this is something that is really important. The, the good news is that right after COVID, the, the lifespan in, within the United States had declined a bit. And now it's gone back up. So that, let me fix my butt again, sorry. That is good. That's good news that it's at 77. It's bad news that, that it, it falls short right after that. So what can be done to extend the, the life of those of us who are baby boomers so that we can live longer years in good health, if not great health. Be it just adequate health is not good enough. We live in a world of sick care rather than health care, so let's get busy with it. The things that we need to start thinking about are so simple. The four things. Everyone will say, well done, Natasha, we know this. Well, do it. It's what do you eat? What are you eating? Are you eating for the health of your body? Or are you eating for pleasure? Well, you can do both, but better to make it healthy pleasure. Number two, what is your exercise routine? Are you doing aerobics and anaerobics, weightlifting, and also you're know, really getting your heart rate up? Just walk a mile a day, if nothing else. Number three, 
sleep patterns. How you sleep really affects your cognitive properties because your brain starts sorting out through all the data that's gone on during the day during sleep time. So it's really important to get that good night's sleep. And for your community, your tribe, your people, your family, your friends, are you hanging out with people who are supportive of you, who cherish you, or people who are downers that are constantly criticizing you or competing with you in negative ways? Not in healthy competition, but really trying to you know, make you a loser. Identify these things. Those are the four basic things we ought to be doing on a daily basis as our bread and butter or like brushing our teeth. Very basic. Okay, number uh, two things that we need to think about is epigenetics. Epigenetics was a little bit of a pseudoscience in the 20th century, but today epigenetics has grown by milestones. We're finding out that you are not your genes. We used to think it was a like Russian roulette, whatever genes you got by who your mother mated with and, and the, you know, the gestation period until you were born kind of made you who you are. Well, we can change that and that's the great news, that your lifestyle can change the messaging system in your genetics to turn on or off certain genes, the functionality of the genes. You could be carrying, let's just say, a gene for breast cancer or a testosterone cancer. Uh, you could have testes cancer. I mean, you could be carrying that. But if you're living a lifestyle that is conducive to health and longevity, you may not turn that messaging system on. So. It's always best to know your genetic makeup and to be careful, but to live the healthy style that will prolong your health as long as possible. And then we get to genetics. Have your genes sequenced. Um, 23andMe has been well known for many years. There's a new one that has uh, far more uh, genes. I had it on my desk. I don't know what I did with it. Um, Oh, here, Nebula. Nebula, here, I'm looking at it in my bookshelf. Nebula Genomics. It will do a much deeper dive into looking at your genetic makeup. So that's mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing that this weekend, sending off my, my spit, my saliva to them. Know your genes, and that's really important. The, uh, the advances in mitochondrial research to find out the healthier mitochondria is really important. The research in taking a look at just your you know 3D scanning. You can have an MRI of your whole body for, it used to be about 5,000, then it went down to 3,000. Now I think it's about $2,500 to find out what is happening. You know, maybe you have something building that you don't even know you have yet. You could have a tumor that you're not even aware of. So having your whole body scan with a, that, uh, um, a highly sophisticated MRI for a couple thousand dollars is truly worth it. And that's all we can do at this point. There is no cure for aging at this moment. There's a cure for certain diseases, to be sure. So we need to do the best we can and stay as healthy as possible as the science and technology uh, continue to accelerate. Well, and thank you for those wonderful reminders. You know, if I can go off my questions list just a bit, I'm 47 years old and I have elderly parents and a lot of the people in my age group are moving into that caretaking role. And these are issues that affect us as well as our yes. parents, right? So, yes. you know, this is something as a society, as the boomer generation does, you know, reach 65, as you mentioned, um, this just becomes more and more important to all of us, almost regardless of age, you yes. know. And one of the things that I have found is medical wearables are, are also a big help. It doesn't change any of the fundamentals, but at least for me, it's it's starting to provide a little bit of peace of mind, right? We, we yes. at least have some technology for, yes. uh, for elderly people with mobility issues and things like that. Um, you know, the heart rate monitoring and fall detection and things like that. And what I've seen is there are three or four different companies making smart watch devices, a couple making smart bands, and I believe one making a smart ring now. And so this yes. is kind of expanding and giving people more choices. I was looking for my ring. I think I have it in the other room. But I do, do have the smart have, ring. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and those are so valuable for so many things. You know, like we were talking about women's issues earlier. I understand that some of those are doing, they're doing fertility tracking. They're doing body temperature. They're doing all sorts of menstrual cycle tracking, you yes. know, for, 
for younger women and then for older people, the thing that attracted me to it was fall detection and heart rate monitoring. Uh, But there's also blood oxygen monitoring. So there is so much that's moving forward. It, again, it doesn't change the fundamentals that you're focused on, but I think it does help support us as as we move forward. You know? No, I, I agree with you. I, I think that that's such uh, though, though, those were such good points that you just made, and they're important to know about. So there are things that we can be doing on a you know all around us. The the wisdom comes in is what, how, when to do it, and when not to do it. Yeah. I mean, not to get fanatic about it, not to. Um, be where you are, you're not enjoying life, or you're constantly tracking yourself nonstop. Um, you know, it's okay for those who want to do it, but I, I'd rather enjoy as much of life as possible and uh, not get too <laughs> too neurotic about it because, you know, it's anything can happen at any time. That's why chronics is still number one, plan A, I, I think, that for, and, and until that if you don't have a backup plan, if something were to happen out of the blue, a car accident, you know, just a slip and fall. You mentioned something, and that brings us back to this. Um, you said you had so many friends that were starting to deal with the, their elderly parents and having um, the responsibility of, of nurturing and protecting and caring for their parents. I did the same thing. And it's it's it's. It's a double-edged sword. And in one way, it's so rewarding to have that opportunity to give back. On the other side of that, it is is so, you need support. It, it can be so yeah. downcast and um, shocking, if not horrifying, when your parents have dementia or Alzheimer's. Or, you know, it's the changing of the diapers. That was fine for me. I could deal with that. But the the dementia uh, was really, really the hardest thing to deal with. And one thing here that I want to mention is in my latest research on neuroplasticity, um, I learned that by 2030, dementia will have tripled. The rate of dementia today will have tripled by 2030, and there's a lot of dementia in the world. So we're looking at millions of people, not just in one country, in one location, but around the world having dementia. And that is going to be a heavy burden for all of us, in not for only for ourselves, but the people we care for and uh, uh, in our you know healthcare system. And so if there's any way that we can re- support um, the research on neuroplasticity or, or cognitive issues of dementia and the Alzheimer's disease, it's so important for us because if we're living to 65 and every 10 years, you know, someone turns 65 every day and 10 years, it's, you know, looking at what's going on and then the, the, the tripling of dementia, we don't want to be in our senior years walking around bumping into walls or, you know, having to be caretaken, you know, like children. So this is very serious for us and we need to get on it and pay attention to it. So um, the things that we can do for cognitive plasticity are very important. And I asked a friend of mine, David Eagleman, who had the TV show called The Brain. If you remember, he's a neuroscientist, a, a, a fine human being. And he said something I think that's really important. I asked him, what do we do about neuroplasticity? Should uh, I learn a new language, learn a new dance step, um, do the crossword puzzles? He said, do something that challenges you, that causes you to get so frustrated and then accomplish it and get to the next side of it. You will have created a new neural pathway. You've got those neurons firing and charged up. He said, the stress that comes with learning something new that is difficult is worth the effort because my mother did crossword puzzles and, and pray, play bridge every day oh, yeah. and she had dementia and I couldn't understand it. Well, it could be hereditary. It could be anything could have caused it. Maybe epigenetics, maybe her lifestyle. I don't know. But the point is, if we're going to keep that neuroplasticity, we need to exercise in different ways. I'm learning French. It's the most difficult language for me to learn. Italian was not so hard. Uh, French is very hard because I can't pronounce, I can't move my mouth in that direction. So I'm making myself learn it 15 minutes a day because it's difficult. Dance is easy. I'm a dancer, so I'm not doing that one. But I'm, I'm finding things that are more difficult to do and making myself do it as, you know, as part of my routine. Wonderful. Well, and again, thank you for sharing 
all of these insights and, and guidance and suggestions too. You know, especially when it comes to things like neuroplasticity. Yeah. So let me let me change topics a little bit. I want to touch on transhumanism. Again, mm -hmm. you wrote the first version of the Transhumanist Manifesto nearly 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now you are working on something new called the Transhumanism Affirmation. So I didn't want to neglect that. I absolutely wanted to ask, what is that? Is that kind of an expansion of the core tenets of the original manifesto, or is this something entirely new? It's something entirely different. And it's something, it's, uh, it's an itch that needed scratching, number one. And number two, it's done out of necessity. There are too many, um, put my, my glass again so I can see you more clearly. Uh, there's too many articles in newspapers, in magazines. There's too much academic uh, posturing, um, dissertations, whether it's a master's level or the PhD level. Um, there's too many books written that get it wrong. And it's just so frustrating. Uh, <laughs> it's so frustrating because you can, how, how much, how can you clearly say um, things any clearer than you can say them. It's, you know, I, I've always tried to follow the, you know, keep it simple, stupid, you know, the Occam's razor uh, theoretical approach to information. <laughs> but it seems like even if you say it as simply and directly as possible, people keep on packing, packing on their own fears and making it your, you caused their fear. That was our latest roundtable, which I suggest your audience listen to. I'm, I'm editing it right now. It was a video with two academics, philosophers who are anti-transhumanists. Both have written books and spoken widely about their anti-transhumanist views. And on the other side of the, the table was uh, Max Mora, the author of The Philosophy of Transhumanism, and my partner, and David Wood, my dear, dear friend. And he is... Um, the uh, the founder of the London Futurist, which is a renowned futurist group in, uh, among many books that, that David Wood has written. Okay, I'm trying to narrow it down to the most obvious misconstruences and misinformation. I'm putting it in the transhumanist affirmation. So there is one document that addresses the, the, the most repeated misinformation findings. <laughs> Uh, for example, I'm going to see if I can give them to just right off the top of my head. Okay, transhumanisms, transhumanists hate their bodies. No, I'm a bodybuilder. My husband's a bodybuilder. I'm an athlete. I've been skiing for years. I'm a dancer. Why would I hate my body? So that's ridiculous. We just want to ditch our bodies and upload into cyberspace. No, not true. Okay, the next one is we strive for perfection. Our goal is to be the perfect human, that we just want to be perfect. No, no way. It is counter to the philosophy of transhumanism and to self-actualization, which is fundamental to transhumanism, which is um, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs of the human, which is very well known in psychology. The idea of perfection is a point of stasis. You can't go anyplace else. You're perfect. That to me is heaven. That's a very religious type of sentiment. Transhumanists strive to, to grow and learn and, and keep on uh, living and, and questioning themselves. And it's, it's a mature sensibility. It's being an adult. Okay, so those two are, are ridiculous assumptions. They've been going on for decades. So those are the, 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 the basic silly ones. Um, the third one, we're all white male elitists. Uh, last time I looked in my pants, I was not a man, and I'm not right now. So forgive me very much, but I am a woman, and I like being a woman. So let's get this straight. It is not all men, and they're not all white. Who is saying this? Where did that come from? So there are a lot of men, to be sure, and there are highly astute thinkers. There have accomplished many uh, great things, to be sure, but there's women too. So that was a cut and paste. Okay, another thing, uh, transhumanism, transhumanists, um, let's see, want to integrate with AI to take over the world. Transhumanists support the integration with artificial intelligence as a technology to help us better understand the world around us because our cognitive properties can't gather all the information. Our processing system doesn't function as 
well as a computational system. So we rely on AI to help us better understand things. And this has been going on for years. Our cars run on AI, our refrigerators, our telephone, we're using AI right now, but that's narrow AI. So artificial general intelligence, another concept coined by uh, Sean Legg, Ben Gertzwell, and Peter Voss, is about um, bottom up. And that's where you get into strong AI. And it is true that transhumanists looking at the far future are thinking about that one day we will integrate with a strong AI, but it's only for the betterment or to improve the consequences of our species and to preserve our species. It's not like we want to kick everyone aside. So those are the silly things. Now here they get even sillier. Transhumanists are capitalists who uh, run the big corporations and we've caused global warming. We caused climate change. That was one assumption that was provided by two of the individuals at this round table that I mentioned I was editing. Okay, assumption number one, capitalism is not one concept. There are many different forms of capitalism. I think there's five forms of capitalism. Many transhumanists support free market economy. And we mentioned this. And the free market economy would have to be in a, uh, um, a healthy commons, if that's possible, and also understand the externalities and what causes that free market to change in one way or another. But it is not owned by a government or an industry or a corporation. It's a free market of exchange between human beings. That is a type of capitalism, but free market economy is different than what is called capitalism by the big surge in anti-capitalism today. We're seeing it everywhere. It's blamed on capitalism. And the next point is that transhumanism is very concerned about the environment. I am an environmentalist and making a link between transhumanists and all white male capitalist elitists taking over the world and causing climate change is, 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 it's a fairy tale. And it's, um, it's strange at best, but I can understand how they got there because they're picking and choosing their references based on existential risk and based on biblic terms. Uh, one, one person, Joe Allen, very nice man. He works for, um, a very right wing, um, advocate uh, and um, uh, he has a program on transhumanism from the alt-right and saying how it's satanic. And I'm going, what are you talking about? Uh, they, they, the anti-transhumanists are trying to pack on all this stuff and blame it on transhumanism be only because transhumanism gets a lot of press. Mm. Uh, it, we could be called anything and it, it really is not related or relevant to transhumanism. And we're getting, uh, and, it's, and it's unfortunate to be sure. And so the transhumanism affirmation is going to point these ideas out and say how, why they're wrong. And then any journalist, you didn't read the affirmation. You didn't read the affirmation because there's, you know, we've written about this. Many of us have written yeah. about this for, for decades now and tried to explain this very clearly. And um, it's better to blame it on the unknown and blame it on the person who gets the most press. So transhumanism gets a lot of press. So let's blame it on transhumanism and it gets a lot of press. But let's blame it on the famous transhumanists like Ray Kurzweil or Martin Rothblatt or um, Peter Thiel or Elon Musk. And uh, so they get blamed for this. And it, that's so wrong. And, you know, the whole thing is is bad. But, you know, I think as far as some of the issues, I, I, I do have compassion about it. I, I think that we really need to be um, very smart about uh, global warming and really deal with it and find solutions and deal with the in, inequities in the world and, and find solutions to deal with the, the different countries in the world that are suffering and find solutions. But, you know, what can transhumanism do other than try to set um, in place a visionary concept of what could it, what it could be like through practical processes, um, like the proactionary principle, for example, looking at all sides of the issue in a balanced, reasonable way, rather than blaming and using hyperbole to say that the planet has five more years to live and it's going to die. 
that's not helping anyone. <laughs> bottom yeah. line, I guess. Well, and you know, again, I mean, from everything that I've read that you've ever written, you know, my takeaways, I mean, you've talked about self transformation and self creation, but for me, that really comes down to taking personal responsibility, right? For your yeah. body, for your environment. I mean, yeah. for, for all of those things, you know, for, our, and that extends to our communities and our planet and all that yeah. as well. So yeah, to hear these, these other misconstrued concepts is just so surprising. That it's, I'm it's not surpri- that and it's, and, um, it's surprising. I mean, it's, you scratch your head and go, why are they doing this? And then if, then when I think about it more clearly, I go, well, the academics need to make their names known in academia. So they're building off of transhumanism, something that's been debated in academia for a while now. And then they're putting their spin on it to, to even get more attention, to get more funding in their department or whatever. There's one professor, I won't mention his name, but he's at a, a school in, in um, um, Great Britain. And he took the proactionary principle which was a concept that came out of a 2004 summit with myself and uh, Max Moore and Nick Bostrom and Martin Rothblatt and Ray Kurzweil and a number of really, uh, Christine Peterson, a number of agile thinkers about the moratorium placed on stem cells. And that was our whole reason for having this summit. And we came up with a way that um, regulations could be determined based on looking at all sides of the issue rather than using the usual precautionary principle, which puts the onus, the burden of proof only on the new concept, the new technology or the new science or the new idea. And if there's any, any chance of something going wrong, you know, you have to stop it. Well, there's always going to be a chance of something going wrong. You have to pivot and understand it and solve it. On this point, I just want to make one, one thing. Last night we went to a movie. We went to go see Godzilla. It's a Japanese film. It's in a few theaters. It's not widely promoted or marketed. Um, and what I loved about it is that the townspeople, well, the people of Japan got together, the boatsmen, the, the pilots, the those, the citizens, to protect their communities against Godzilla. And it was like a very beautiful team effort of we've got to solve this, where the army and the government said, oh, they gave up. They just said Godzilla is going to take over Japan. You know, there's nothing you could do. But it was the people said, no, we're not going to let this happen. And they found they created an innovative way to deal with Godzilla to stop Godzilla within the script of the film, within in okay. that, that uh, storyline. And I think that's beautiful. That That's something I also love about transhumanism is the respect for human innovation, that rather than being hyperbolic about the problems that we have in the world, which are many, um, and blaming it on this person or that person or this belief or that belief, to find innovation, so innovative solutions. And um, so I left that movie just feeling good, feeling good. Wonderful. Well, Natasha, let me thank you so much for your time today. We have covered so many topics. I actually had a much longer list of questions, but we I think we have blown so many minds just for today. So what, why don't we close things out? Again, I want to say thank you so much. It is always a tremendous oh. pleasure and honor to have you on. And again, as I have more questions, this means perhaps we can do another <laughs> in the next month or two. No, I love talking to you. And so... Anytime, I, I value you so much, as you know. Well, thank you. Thank well, thank you. you. Uh, well, uh, so let me close, though, by asking what is coming up in early 2024? Because I know that you have your hands full with so many different projects, as well as leadership and education and, again, the transhumanism affirmation and, you know, women in longevity leadership as well, right? So, so many different things going on. What What is coming up the next month or two? Okay, so doing? next month, we're in, okay, January, we've got Transvision 2024, and it's in the Netherlands, and it, it'll be a great event. So, everyone tell your audience, just Google Transvision 2024. That's in January. Um, in February is the Beneficial Artificial Intelligence Summit. Well, it's Beneficial AGI. That's in Panama City in Panama. And it's um, 
uh, by invitation only, but then it opens up to the public so people can uh, get their uh, reservation online for the online part of the event. So that is going to be incredible because we're going to address how AI can be truly beneficial to help with so many problems that the, the world is facing today. So it's beneficial AI, a big turn from uh, the fear of AI and existential risk right now. Um, then let's see, um, women in longevity leadership, we're going to be bringing in uh, members and hosting an event. So that's coming up. In Rome, uh, there's going to be a session at the university on transhumanism and is put on by um, one of my colleagues in Nigeria, uh, Chagwu, and he's going to be heading the panel. So that's in Rome. And all this will be on Humanity Plus's website and my personal website. Let's see. Oh, Afro Longevity in Nigeria in um, October of 2024. So those are just a few of the events um, that I can think of right off the top of my head. But, you know, things change and new ideas come up very quickly. And sometimes we just decide to get together and, and have a, a shindig, you know. Uh, so, um, yeah, always be alerted. And please join Humanity Plus to help us fight off these naysayers and... Um, the, the misinformation, I think it's not just within transhumanism, but the naysayers, uh, it's this hate speech. And there's one thing on TV that I like, and I don't watch much TV other than for research, but it says, every second there's a hate message going on social media, but hate is everywhere. It's not just religious hate or hate against the um, anti-Semitism right now or the color of your skin or your ethnicity or your gender or transgender or any of these different issues, the hate is rampant. And we need to really get beyond that to be human beings, really healthy human beings. Well, Natasha, let me thank you again so thank much you. for your time today, ma'am.